This podcast is part of the Shareable Podcast Network. Learn more at shareable.fm. This podcast is Shareable. I'm your host, Jeff Gibbard, commonly known as the world's most handsome strategist and professional speaker. I'm also a superhero. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single Shareable episode. And that's it. That's the intro. Short and sweet. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to Shareable. Today, my guest, Marco Ambrosia, is a transformation expert and a serial intrapreneur. If you don't know what that is, we're going to cover that over the course of this episode. And he is currently the VP of Expert Engineering at LivePerson. Uh, you've probably seen Live Person around the web. Uh, if you haven't, we'll go over that too. Uh, but while he is there, one of the things he focuses on is the growth mindset and innovation. And this is a leading conversational AI company in the world. Uh, so you'll want to pay attention. This guy's got really uh, a interesting background that we're going to go all the way through. So uh, I'll stop talking now and just say, Marco, welcome to the show. Tell people a little bit more about yourself and anything that I didn't cover in the intro of what I dug up about you. Yeah, no, Jeff, total pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation. I had a, a good time reading about the super, uh, Superhero Institute and some of the things that you're working on um, and listening to some of your, your old your old shareable content. Um, I mean, it's a pretty solid introduction. Most of my career has focused, you know, I've, I've had like three career pivots, if not four, from social entrepreneur to really focusing on, on public health and uh, doing a little stint at a, as a, basically a research analyst at the World Bank and then getting into consulting and innovation and then really doubling down at live person. Um, it's been an exciting journey. It's something that I'm hoping to share more about. I, I'm lucky enough to have mentored and have, and have been a mentee and um, I'm looking forward to learning from you and sharing some insights that uh, I've learned along the way. Dude, it's you, your background is like phenomenally interesting. And it is, in, it's like kind of mind boggling just how much you've done in, uh, in, in, I mean, if you're anywhere near my age, which I think you're younger than me, it's like, it's mind boggling how much you've done. I know you were also at Sapient uh, as an innovation consultant. Uh, you worked with fortune 500 companies. You've done social entrepreneur work with low and income, uh, low and middle income countries. I mean, dude, like you've done so many different things. So let's go kind of back to the beginning. What did you want to be when you grew up? Because there's no possible way that this story was written you know, yeah. really early in life. Like what did, what did you want to do that got you down the path to doing all this stuff? You've done so many things. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. I've actually never, uh, I've never really had like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. Um, you know, something that like, I, even as a kid though, like, like I wanted to be a professional basketball player, like at 13, oh, I, yeah, I will like, be yeah. the starting point guard for the Knicks. And then like, I wanted to be a filmmaker. And at one point I wanted to be a famous photographer for like swimsuit, uh, or sports illustrated swimsuit edition and Maxim. Cause of course, young guy in his twenties. So like, those were all like dreams, big, bold. Those are the things I want to do. Like you, there's no possible way you got on this path without some sort of a big, bold idea at some point. Well, you would have had some competition for point guard for me of Knicks. That, that is, that is straight up. That would have been something that would have been, uh, a dream come true probably like you know being six one and the starting point guard of the knicks that would have been and probably trying to wear uh john stark's number three that would have been the you know the the, the apex of my like uh, teenage years um you know it's interesting i mean i i always knew a couple things i always knew that i wanted to be doing things that i was really passionate about that i felt like were making a difference and i felt like i could could actually make make a difference whether that's in my own work or in other people's lives and that's not, that may sound cliche, but that's that's really been the guiding force. Um, you know, my my father actually is a, is a physician, and something that I really respect um, from my dad is there was never any pressure to to go become a doctor, and he owns his own practice, so that would have been an easy path, quote unquote, in life. Uh, it was always, you know, it, your 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 teenage years, your your twenties are really meant to get as much experience and diverse experience about where you're passionate about. So that in your 30s you have a focus, um, and we have a saying like uh, my dad has a saying, uh, you know, uh, you know you can shovel shit for a year as long as you learn something really important, but if you shovel shit for two years you're a shit shoveler. Yeah. Uh, so that's really <laughs> that's like really focused me every year to like know what I'm trying to learn, and I I've actually been like had an aversion to five year goals or five year plans or ten year goals or ten year plans. Uh, it's always been directionally, what are my guiding lights? 
and, uh, and, you know, and be opportunistic about what you're trying to learn so that, you know, you don't have a regret. Uh, you know, we, we definitely have a family saying you'd rather live with failure than regret. So I've, I've really have tried to hone in on what's going to, what's going to really excite me. And that's something you can do until you have a mortgage or a family. Uh, I feel like you owe yourself that, uh, in your, in your twenties or in your thirties, you know, when you're, once you have a mortgage or you have a family, uh, you can't be as bold, but you better be bold uh, until you have those things. Yeah. One of my best friends in the world, uh, she and her husband decided to quit their jobs and travel the world for 10 months. And before they did it, I remember them, you know, she and I would sit down for coffee and she'd be going through the machinations of it because like it was a big, you know, she likes safety, security, that sort of thing. So like, this was like a crazy idea. And she went through it, went through it, went through it. And she was like, you know what, screw it. We're going to do it because I would rather... I would rather go and do it and come back after two months if it doesn't work out or whatever, than regret not having taken that chance. And now she looks back on, she's like, it's one of the best things we've ever done for us closer as a couple. It was one of the most amazing times we've ever had. So yeah, I'm with that hundred percent. I'm the same way. Like I think about it a lot in terms of, you know, uh, the idea of motivation and inspiration and all that. Like one of the things that always gets me over that hump is thinking about that. Like, would I regret this if I didn't do it? And I think it goes back to like, at some point in my like teens where I was like, I should go talk to that girl. And then I didn't. And then just carried that with me. I was like, never gonna let, never gonna have that happen again. It's gonna go yeah. to the girl. It's, it's certainly interesting. I mean, so I'm, so I'm Catholic and uh, I went to a Jesuit high school, St. Peter's Prep in, in Jersey City. And then I actually went to a Jesuit um, University Fairfield in, in Connecticut. And uh, something that really stayed with me in, in high school um, there, so if you're not familiar with the Jesuits, there's this whole, uh, St. Ignatius Loyola has Ignatian spirituality, which is like different ways of, of, of meditation and, and introspection. It's very important to, to St. Ignatius. But one of the reflective exercises you do, uh, it's very focused on discernment. And you just popped in my head because one of the exercises is imagine yourself, if you have something that you're like really trying to make a decision on, like imagine yourself on your deathbed. Think about that decision now. How do you feel about the decision? Is there anything different? And sometimes it really helps clear up like, oh, you know what? I'm going to regret if I didn't do that. I got to go do this. And that's literally what happened. Like when I graduated college, I had this opportunity where I was like, you know what? I could piece this thing together. I could go raise my own money. Just like, you know, actually, but then it wasn't Obama style. But I basically raised about 20,000 bucks, but, but in like 25, 50, $75, $100 increments. And I spent time in different countries learning different models for how do you provide care and support to marginalized people, um, no matter where they are. But it was, I'm really fascinated by models, business models, and also just like self-replicating, like moving away from nonprofit and more towards sustainable social innovation and social entrepreneurship. So it's super exciting for me. And a lot of that actually came from this concept of, well, you know what, even if you fail, you're going to learn so much that that's, that's part of the journey. Dude, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated talking with you about it. Cause I feel like you and I have so much that we overlap on. Um, there's a, there's another thing. Have you ever heard Tim? I don't know if it's not Tim Ferriss's thing, but he talks a lot about the power of negative thinking, where if you are fearful about a thing, you just play it out in your head. You go all the way down to like the worst possible case scenario. And once you get to that bottom, you find basically, well, that wouldn't be the end of it. I could probably still turn that around, right? Like, so you, you get kind of like, okay with it. And it kind of clears up some of that, uh, that uncertainty. But you were talking about, um, you know, working with um, uh, low and middle income countries and like underprivileged and, and marginalized communities. And I want to go into that. Um, but you also brought up the idea of moving away from nonprofits and moving towards social enterprises. Have you read, um, uh, I think it's called Building a Social Business by Muhammad Yunus? Oh, so, so one of my like heroes in life is Muhammad Yunus and I've actually gotten a chance to meet him. Really? Uh, yeah, no. So there's a, like, I, so I, I've been consulting, you know, you meet with a lot of senior executive yeah. CEOs of this company, CMO of this company. And in my young, in my young career, I was lucky enough to be in the room with some very senior business people. And my senior execs would always be like, Marco, you're never nervous in front of these people. And I would tell them, I've already met my heroes. Like I've, I, I met, like I spent time with Paul Farmer, who's this amazing, amazing uh, human rights physician who runs Partners in Health and the MacArthur Genius Award winner. And I've got to meet him multiple times and interview him and spend time with them. Like got to meet Muhammad Yunus, Hans Rosling. Like 
those are people who are like really inspirational, high impact, holds no bar, like just movers and shakers. So I kind of always felt like if you got to meet those people and spend time with those people, you're not going to be as, uh, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal when you meet the CEO or CMO of a Fortune 500 company. Well, you also realize that they're just human beings too. Yeah, they're like, human, yeah. We tend to like build them up in our heads and then you, you meet someone and you're like, oh, wow, you're just like a normal person that's just doing awesome, ambitious things that I align with. I, I really appreciate that. So, so I want to talk about two things next. Uh, I want to talk about your work with uh, marginalized communities, what got you into it, what sort of work that you were doing. And then I, I really want to touch on this growth mindset thing, because I, I, I can see it already just in the rather living with failure than regret, like that's a, a classic growth mindset uh, of resilience and, and confidence and, you know, kind of courage and fearlessness. Um, but let's start with the work with the marginalized communities. Why was that important to you? What sort of work were you doing? And kind of where do you stand with it now, uh, just in case people want to potentially at the end of this episode, uh, connect with you and get involved and, and help your efforts? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, uh, you know, in Jesuit education, like a big thing is service learning. So, like, you know, you go and actually you learn by doing. So I uh, was lucky enough um, at Fairfield, I basically started the first internship in Nicaragua because I wanted to go do work with uh, in, in a Spanish speaking country. And so I, uh, at first, it was a, hey, we don't have any, any uh, summer internships in, in Latin America. You can go to Ireland or Australia or Italy. And I was like, well, those are not interesting to me. So I was able to sort of connect directly with uh, the Jesuit University in, in, uh, in Nicaragua and start my own internship, which now actually they do every year at, at, uh, at Fairfield. But um, I just got really passionate about the concept of, of, uh, of access and human rights and you know, sometimes there's there's some, if you really believe that, you know, everybody is sort of, you know, made in the image and likeness of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a God, for instance, um, you know, everybody has the same same wants, dreams, and needs, right? It's, it's, it's something that's universal no matter where you are. So I got really passionate about, about access, access to care, access to education, access to jobs. And, um, you know, I, I focused, if you look at you focus on like infectious disease, like HIV, for instance, or uh, or tuberculosis, or even even malaria. Um, these are these are major big topics, and you really can't deal with them or, or 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 really work on them if you're not taking each part of the stool. Which is you have to address healthcare and access to healthcare. You have to provide education so people actually have can learn, and they have to access to income and jobs. And so I really wanted to to wrestle with this and learn about who are the best organizations around the world who are working in with marginalized populations, what's their model and how do they either provide two or three of these, these aspects to the marginalized. And that's, that was the whole thing. And I basically spent, you know, I'd raise enough money, go to one place, come back, speak about it, raise enough money to go to the second place. And I ended up doing that in Nicaragua. And then, uh, so Nicaragua was a nonprofit, um, it was a self-help group that was run by uh, men and women that had HIV AIDS. Uh, in California, it was a nonprofit that was a food, it's a, it's a food service program. The first one uh, in, in the country, it's called Project Open Hand in, in the Tenderloin. Uh, then there was a, I, I lived in a, a, a Buddhist AIDS temple um, in central Thailand for a bit. Uh, then I was in Rwanda with a human rights program that's, that's based off of, uh, run by Partners in Health. And then I was in India in, uh, with Reliance Industries, which is the one of the biggest companies in all of all of India, which is, I was really lucky that the year I went, they won the, the Golden Peacock Award for Best Corporate Social Responsibility Program in, in India. So I was learning these different models and spending time with sociologists, economists from the universities, and then just spending time doing home visits in the clinics, talking to people, nurses, executive directors, funders, and just really, you know, learning, for lack of better words, and getting inspired. And that's, I'm super excited. I know that potentially I'll, we'll, I'll be interviewing you, and I know you have a book coming out on leadership. And I ended up giving speeches about all these amazing people. I, I talked, you know, probably 20 different universities, eight different states, and it was never about me. It was about all these amazing, heroic people who are doing tremendous things against seemingly endless odds. And that's just inspiring. And that's something that, 
you know, I did, I did that for about two years uh, that laid the foundation for the rest of my life. All this is amazing, and it's right in line with the work that um, I, I aspire for the Superhero Institute to be doing and inspiring people to do a lot of what you're talking about, uh, using their time and talents to make the world a better place. One thing I really want to pick up on, I think this leads us into the conversation around the growth mindset, is you talk a lot about learning and about absorbing information and the methods that you used for doing it. Um, and you also talked a little bit about modeling, uh, frameworks, looking for ways of sort of simplifying the big ideas of what's working and what's not. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach and think about the growth, growth mindset, both for yourself and also for the teams that you're working with? What are some of the kind of starting points for embedding that kind of a mindset and some of the tactical things you do to move that along? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So, so that live person, when I joined live person, uh, the, I, my, my, first job is basically helping the sales teams build big three-year visions for prospects and customers. And uh, that, that was basically piggybacking off of my innovation consulting days at Sapien. And that was actually really fun and, and passionate. And you're really focused on, okay, what does a brand care about? What is the bit like from a brand perspective? What does the business care about from a business objective? But then also most importantly, what are the end users? What do they care about? What are their jobs to be done? What are their pains? What are their gains? Like what's, and that requires a lot of empathy research uh, and spending time with people who are the end users and putting it all together into an organizing idea. And then that's what you're going to go, you're going to go talk to a CEO or CMO or chief digital officer about. Um, I started getting stops at live person uh, at different events, fast company, you name it. And Rob, our founder and CEO pulled me off the, the line and he was like, listen, I want you to help me. I know you're building three year visions for the clients. I want you to work with me on our three year vision. And I want you to start thinking about how do we hire more people like you? Like, and when I asked him, like, what, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, I want, I want people that, that are understanding the digital, but also just like really like not afraid of failure, like put themselves out there and, and have this, have a, a growth mindset. So that meant I had to like really unpack what the heck that means. Right. So we spent a lot of time talking, uh, the two of us, and uh, we settled on curiosity as a main pillar of, of, um, of this mindset, uh, looking at failure as opportunity. That was a massive other, other, uh, other uh, pillar. And then this third one was, uh, you know, I think we, I, I really believe that you, you, to be, to learn and to learn quickly, uh, especially in, in tech companies, you want to be someone who can connect dots and be collaborative. And so those are sort of the three big areas but then we designed, okay, how do we, how do we hire against, it, against this? And I had not been ever done any recruiting. Uh, so I eventually pretty quickly became the head of recruiting, head of talent management and performance, the head of compensation, benefits, uh, uh, enablement, and then uh, some strategic projects for, the, for Rob, the, the founder. Um, and it was always to be, hey, transform these divisions, centralize them, stabilize them, innovate, and then level them up, and then we're going to bring in people to actually take them once they're ready to sort of go on. Like the ship's built, once they're off the harbor, like that's that's the time to move on to something else. And I just think this nugget, like those three pieces of the puzzle, are so important if you're a high growth tech company. I mean, we are. There's a concept in 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 SaaS and in, uh, software. You want to be rule of forty, which means that your you know your revenue growth and your and your profit margin when you combine them, they equal 40 or higher. And that's like the, that's like the creme de la creme tech companies. Uh, you know, we've been able to achieve that in Q3 last year and Q4 last year, which is a great high mark. But if you're going to maintain that kind of growth or even hit that kind of growth, we really wanted to focus on how do you find people who are good in the gray, who are not afraid of failure, who can work in teams, connect dots, and really move at pace because the conversational commerce Space, it is the next. It, it's the current, but it's you could think of it as it's the next frontier. You know, the world went internet, e-commerce, and now comes c-commerce. You classify yourself as an entrepreneur, which I think is interesting context for all of this. Because as I'm listening to you talk about it, the first thing that jumps through my mind is like, okay, culture. 
because it's not just about acquiring those people, but it's about keeping those people. Yeah. Because that growth require you can't scale if you're constantly churning good people. So I know that you've been involved in the culture efforts there. I'm curious how it, you're obviously very entrepreneurial, but you've also been able to function excessively well in a variety of different roles. I'm curious what your thoughts are on culture, how you go about approaching it, how you go about catering a culture to, you know, to take into account what people want and also what the business is looking for. Like, how do you go about dealing with the sort of stuff? You were thrust into this recruiting and talent uh, uh, role where you had to bring people in, but you also have to be accountable for how they stay and, and why they stay and all of that. So can you talk a little bit about how you've approached that? Yeah, I think for anyone who's, uh, whether it's at the company level or maybe maybe you're taking over a team or, or, or you're combining two teams, uh, the first meeting, like for instance, at my first meeting with my team, um, I told them very clearly, I'm not an expert in recruiting I'm, or I'm not an expert in enablement. Um, but, you know, my what, what I can be an expert in is building this team, creating a culture of these kinds of pillars and then being, being someone who can help coach and I can learn from you, you can learn from me, and we're going to achieve these goals together kind of thing, which is the truth. I'm not going to go position myself as an expert in front of a bunch of people who are experts. Um, and so I think it's really important. Step one is establish what is the culture of the team. And, uh, you know, for me, it's, you got to put up there, like, what are the five tenets or the five principles? And one of them has to be, don't fear failure. Like failure is an opportunity for learning because that just takes people, takes, takes the, any kind of tension or pressure off. Like I'm telling them, we are going to be innovative and it's okay to fail. Uh, the next thing I, I put in there was uh, talked about how, uh, you know, we want to, we want to take uh, an iterative improvement uh, mentality, right? Measure everything and launch your alpha, launch your beta, then go full. Don't, don't wait until something's perfect. Uh, run these little tests, measure, get the data, and incrementally improve it. And then uh, the third one that I always put in there is around collaboration. Uh, like you know, we, we're a team. Like you got everyone's here for each other. You got to pick each other up. There's good days, there's bad days. But what you have is you have a team that's committed to you. And one thing I'm super proud of is you know the team is about 35 people, half half women, half more than half non I would say non white males. Um, and when I did the, I do anonymous surveys, uh, just because, you know, let everyone sort of share what, what they want to share, uh, a hundred percent of people and team said they could be innovative as part of this team. And like that to me is the metric I really care about. It's an anonymous survey. I got a hundred, I got a hundred percent of people saying they feel they could be innovative in their role on this team. And that's why we were able to achieve so much because you're unlocking people's own talent. You know, it's, it's, it's that's the only way you're going to scale or get a lot of great ideas. If it's you get the people who are working day, day in day out, bubbling up innovations and feeling confident enough to share their creative idea. I think so. This this idea of culture is like such a hot topic these days, given the remote work, given the unemployment rate, given the, you know, arguments over different types of wage ideas. There's like, it, it's a wild west out there. And culture has become a very important topic, especially seeing employees disengage and all that. And you kind of brought up like three things that you're like, oh, these are kind of always a part of it, or at least in your mind, like, you know, I immediately start with, don't be afraid to fail. So I guess my question for you is, how much do you think of a culture should be customized versus what should be kind of um, standard across the board in every company? So for instance, like, you know, competition is an interesting factor, right? Like some, some cultures really like competition and others find that it creates a toxic work environment, right? Some would say, don't be afraid to fail. And others might say, uh, you know, we don't, we, we operate at the highest level. Like we, we don't make mistakes and like email turnaround time is like, you know, two hours. So how much do you think of an effective culture is going to be sort of not relative to the circumstance, but should just be across the board, like a culture of respect would be like an obvious one. Yeah, right? yeah. How much, how much do you think is like, 
there's there's a handful of things that are going to be always versus how much is customized. How would you break that down? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. I think first, it just depends on what kind of business you're in. Um, you know, when I was uh, at Sapient, it's client, it's you know, we're 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 clients, we're services, we're selling services, right? So one of the top premier things is client focused delivery. Uh, you know, always being there for your client whenever you need, whenever they need you, providing the most, you know, the most up to date, you know, the SLAs, whatever that may be. Um, and that may be different if you're if you're in the nonprofit space or if you're in in SaaS. Um, so I think one, it just depends on the industry you're in. I do think, like you were saying, you're spot on. There's there is a table stakes that regardless of what industry you're in, you know, you have to hit. Like just being respectful is is uh, is, is table stakes. Um, that was the, kind of the expression I think I was looking for was table stakes. Like how yeah. much is table stakes? How much is customized? Yeah, I, listen, I, I feel like in especially for younger generations, like millennial and, and down, I think you're not going to attract top talent if you're not pretty clear on what you stand for as a company and what your principles are. And how those principles manifest in the day-to-day is super important. So, you know, we, you know, we take the principles super serious. Rob is always thinking about them uh, and how we actually manifest in the company. You know, one of the things for me was taking those and making sure they permeate through. Because uh, if you think about what we did, we tried this experiment where, okay, so if, if, if all of who we hire, how we hire, or who we hire, how we hire, how we enable, and, and what the performance metric and compensation, all of that lives under one person, does that create a flywheel effect? And can you make, it, can you make enough incremental improvements so that you're lifting all boats? So that's what we really, really went for holistically. And uh, we, one of the things we did was we made sure that the principles all of a sudden were tied to the questions that we're asking, the hiring decisions, the enablement and the orientation programs, how people are assessed in the company, what the promotion criteria are. All of a sudden, we just brought that up a level. Um, and I think that's where, where you see principles, uh, the rubber hits the road, because if a company is just has a bunch of things on a wall, but they are, they're not lived, I don't think you're going to keep talent, especially millennial talent and the next generation behind them. You brought up a really interesting point there because I've been in a lot of companies where they hang their values on the wall or like, God forbid, motivational posters. Um, and a lot of those companies, it's like they've written down their culture, but they haven't necessarily honored it. And then in some places, it's like they have a culture, but it's kind of a spoken, understood culture rather than something that's written down. Um, you've obviously been very conscious about how you've gone about designing the culture uh, in, in your role. What do you think is the right approach, or I guess, what do you think is an effective approach towards the balance between um, the way it is around here that we all understand versus what's written down? And when you when you write it down, does that box you into something that doesn't allow the culture to evolve? How do you approach that balance between defining who you are on paper versus understanding who you are in practice? I think it's a fair question. I also think with, given all the, the change and shifts with COVID, it forced every company, I think, to think to introspectively look, how has your culture changed or should your culture change given what we've what we've experienced? Um, and it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I you know, we at Live Person, uh, we, we really, you know, unfortunately we lost a young colleague, a 23 year old young man, uh, really early in, in the COVID, um, uh, I guess the, the first phases of, of the pandemic in, in late February of last year. Uh, and, you know, Rob, Rob is the kind of person, and this is something this is what people always ask, why do you work in life first? One of the reasons is we have a, I like working in a founder-led company, but the founder has to be the kind of person who you believe in. And like one of the things that when I interview people, they ask, you know, I always tell them a story. It's like, we were one of the first publicly traded companies just close all our offices, uh, and in that decision, you know, we, we lost a, we lost a colleague, and Rob really quickly was like, "We got it. Like this is like, there's just too much uncertainty in people's lives. We got to close these offices so that people have certainty, uh, so they can plan their lives. They can feel safety and security. Because if you don't feel secure, what like you know what else do you have? So it's super interesting because you think about table stakes, security 
is one of those table stakes things. You can't really do anything else. So I, I've seen how our culture has shifted because of COVID. You know, we've, we're much more, we've moved as fast as possible to an asynchronous way of working. We also moved to a written culture so that it's, it's you know, we do a lot of drafting of, of a document, but then it's, it lives there. People comment on it. It's not like I have to meet, we're a global company, but you don't have to meet at the same time. I can draft something. It can be reviewed whenever. I tell my team, hey, I'm drafting this. Just give me your comments in the next 48 hours because I'm going to pick it up in, in 48 hours. And they, whatever time it is for them, they pop in all their comments, their thoughts. Uh, and, and we work in that way instead of having a meeting culture. Um, and then it's a living document there. And that's, that's, that's a new way of working for us. Same thing with, you know, we, we treat people like adults. You own your own calendar. Here are your goals. If you want to work at start at 10 in the morning, great. Just make up the hours later in the day. Um, and I, I've seen how it's, it's been a learning process for us and one that is super focused on our, our people and uh, our customers. So obviously your company is okay with remote work and actually apparently is thriving with it. Um, sounds like you made the decision pretty early on and you figured out ways of making that work. There's still a lot of companies out there that are resistant to this idea of remote work that are trying to bring people back into the office. Um, so I guess I would, I would ask you one, what would your advice be to companies that are reluctant to embrace a new model of working that might be more remote and asynchronous? Uh, and let's just start there. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to lose talent. I mean, I'm, I'm, I see it. Uh, you know, I see people from top top tier companies, um, many of which are some of the, the you know the big tech companies who have joined us at Live Person simply because you know they they see what's going on in the tech stack. They they like where we're positioned, but they they want to work remote. They want to know. We have people. They apply. They apply. They oh, I'm, I'm in Seattle. Um, but if I get this job, I'm going to move to Austin. Uh, or I'm in Seattle. If I if I get this job, I'm going to move to uh, Salt Lake, um, and so it's it's super interesting. I mean, there's there's a there's a shift happening. Uh, as much as I am a believer in the economies of scale of cities and how that helps with greenhouse gas and, and all these different things, I, I see you know there's still a wave of of people leaving S uh, Seattle, New York, for Florida, Nashville. Uh, Austin, 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 um, you know, Arizona. It's just interesting to see how, what the world's going to look like uh, from, a, from the a talent perspective, because even myself, before, a year and a half ago, I never would have hired someone in Arizona. Yet, when I look for who's my head of enablement and who's really going to lead the charge in, uh, and, you know, have, have that gravitas from a sales perspective for sales enablement, I found the I found the best guy in Arizona, and he's awesome. Uh, but I would never would have even thought of hiring him before. I would have looked just in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So I, I think there's a talent aspect here, and if you don't if you don't shift, you're going to miss out on on uh, what's going to be a competitive advantage for other people. I have a friend of mine who's a web developer. I've known him for like a decade, and it must have been eight nine years ago when I first heard him say you know, we're all in a war for the best talent. And to think that the best talent is within driving distance of your office is crazy. And yeah. I'm like, man, like that makes perfect sense. Like, you know, he was looking for other developers. What are the chances that the best developer that he could hire is, you know, in Philadelphia when they could be in like the middle of rural Kansas, they just happen to be an amazing developer and that's where they like to be. So I always thought that that was like a pretty obvious sort of thing. And I, I'm genuinely surprised by the reluctance to move to asynchronous remote work. I think a couple of things. I think once, I think you'll still see clusters. Like there's always, good, I think there's still going to be uh, like a cloud computing cluster in Seattle. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's not going to go away. Uh, you know, I think you know, you're still going to see if you're in pharma, for lack of better words, you know, the research triangle in North Carolina, it's still going to be a bastion for talent. Um, but I do think you're going to see the rise of second tier cities. Um, you know, if I, if, if I was in real estate, Two years ago, no one was coming. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, Austin has become a hotbed, Nashville. It's also interesting to see, like, can these cities absorb all these people? Um, it's, you know, I'm not an urban planner, but it, it's got to be interesting because there has to be a, a planning effect. Um, 
for, for these cities. So uh, I want to shift to something that's related, I believe, but we've talked about solving a lot of different problems. We've talked about culture. We've talked about the growth mindset. We've talked about moving to remote. We've so there's a lot of different things that we've covered in this episode already. And I can't believe how the time is just flying. I feel like I have to have you back for a follow-up episode, by the way, because um, there's so many things we could talk about. But in terms of solving problems, early on, you kind of talked a little bit about frameworks and about modelings or, or models. Um, but you also have uh, an education in design thinking as well. So starting here, what is design thinking for those that have never heard of that? And then let's talk about how you're using that. Yeah, so design thinking is, it's a, it's a way of problem solving, for lack of better words. Um, and it really focuses on the first step of design thinking is building empathy with the end user or whoever you're designing for. And that's actually something um, that was, it really spoke to me because I was doing all this work in marginalized, with marginalized people. And I would always volunteer at these places to, to, to build some level of understanding of what the organization and the services are providing. And I would go do the frontline work so I could engage with people. And I would always interview three to five people who are receiving the services. More often than not, I would go to someone's home or, and by home, that's, that's a loose, you know, it's a home, but it may be, um, you know, a, a mud floor and, and mud walls, or it's a home, um, but it may be, you know, a one room uh, place with, with three people and, and a baby living in, um, and this is people's homes. So it really spoke to me. I didn't realize it, but all the ethnography work I was doing abroad, uh, it, it, it really laid bare uh, the first step of design thinking, which is how do you build empathy with people? Like what are the, what are the observational techniques? What are the role play techniques? What are the, the, like the, what are the questions? How do you build, how do you build a rapport with somebody? Uh, and it's, it's starting from there and understanding what they want, what their needs are, what are the pain points? What are the, the pro what are the problems of the jobs to be done? And then you are framing those problems you are then ideating against them. You are then prototyping your solutions, and then you are testing them. Uh, you're testing those prototypes, and that's really that's really the foundations of design thinking. Um, I was lucky enough. Yeah, I was. Well, can, I, can we can we do a live example? Of yeah, how that sure. Works? So yeah. So so let's let's look at uh, let's look at let's go back to what we were just talking about remote teams. So you've got you've got this team that's you know, meeting all in one place or in multiple places, multiple offices, right? You have people coming in, this, this catalyzing event happens. You lose, you know, a young employee, founder says, we got to change this. So you rapidly move into this change of working and you have to apply a way of coming up with a solution for that. Can you walk through a little bit about how you apply design thinking to solving a problem like yeah, that? Yeah, so in that case, you would want to take different kinds of, so you would want to actually go and talk to different people, ideally a representative sample, or you want to you want to over index on super users. One of the key things of design thinking is find the super user because you'll get the most extreme answers and you can design an ID against the extreme. Um, You'd want to find out. So, for instance, uh, you know, you would want to go talk to one of our Japanese colleagues because we know that, or in Israel, because you know the apartments are much smaller than in in the U.S. per se. So, working from home would be much more difficult. Now, you'd go interview them, you talk to them, you pull out, uh, you build a rapport, pull out what are some of the the pain points that they're currently experiencing, what are some of the ideas and the things that are that are positive in their in their new world. And then you would ideate against, how do I solve some of those pain points or fix some of those problems? And that may be, uh, that may take you to different places that then ideally as a business, you're prioritizing against understanding the cost benefit analysis against because you can't do everything for everybody. Uh, and where we landed with that actually, um, we did something pretty interesting. We called it Beehive. This is a big testament to the company in terms of being employee focused. We basically, offered up to, to the entire company, whoever wants to work on this and be part of finding solutions to the way, to the big ticket things that are gonna have to change. Uh, we had, I think over 120 people, 130 people raise their hand globally. And it's an entire employee led uh, initiative. They identified about six different major theme areas. They, they uh, self-selected into those 
and then uh, myself and, and two other uh, uh, execs in the company, we were sort of like the, the Sherpas, uh, stewarding, helping them sort of like think through the idea, codify it, write, the, write what we call a PR, press release, frequently asked questions around their solutions, working with finance to figure out the budgets, and then, we, then they present those to the entire uh, exec team, which is about like 25 people. Um, and so they're owning it. Like it's, they're coming up with their, you know, they know their own issues the most. Um, and so that's how we as a company solved for how to apply design thinking to our, our big, our biggest endeavor, which was shifting the company during COVID to at, at home in the eight or nine countries that we have offices. It seems like a really good blueprint for other companies to follow. I mean, just even hearing you walk through it, it, it seems so obvious looking back at it. Um, but so few companies, I think, have taken that approach. I think possibly for fear of control, you know, fear of losing control, like to, to open up ideas to other people rather than disseminating here's the way it will be. Um, I think it takes a particularly brave uh, company to, to even take that approach. So uh, kudos on live person for doing such a thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think the word bold and courage are super important, particularly for high growth tech companies. Uh, you know, and also, I mean, listen, it also helps, it, it helps our people uh, really, the more you, the more you open up and decentralize uh, a culture, particularly, uh, and solutions and identifying solutions, the more people are bought into the, to the fabric of a company. And also the more you're going to attract talent. I mean, we, we want, we want people who are builders and who are curious people. Uh, we want them to come to work at live person. We want them to feel like, they can have an impact on the company. Uh, I think that's that to me is the beauty of working. We're like we're we're like 12, uh, 1,250, 1,300 people. Like that that's the beauty of a company that size versus you know being in a company 20, 30, 40, 100,000 people. So creating these cultures where people feel 100% of people feel like they can be innovative, right? So let's talk quickly if we could. As I get as our last point, I know we're running out of time here, but uh, the last point to wrap up on, I want to talk a little bit about leadership because, as you know, I, we were talking before we jumped on. I told you I'm coming out with a book uh, on leadership in January of 2022, and just hearing everything that you're doing and what you've done, it's it's obviously we share an interest in that topic. So a lot of companies struggle with getting um, individual contributors to. Um, to step up and be willing to offer up their ideas. And there's also the uh, challenge of when people are so good at a thing that a company wants to move them into a managerial role, maybe managing people or being able to scale a process or something. What, what have you seen in your role that uh, has helped people to successfully transition from being an individual contributor to a management role and from being an individual contributor that maybe is on the outskirts and not participating into being one that is participating? Yeah, I think two things that I, you know, I look for. Um, first is, have they managed projects or programs before? That's a, that's a, that's a, I think that's a, a, you know, a leading indicator that they can also manage, uh, you know, they're used to managing teams. Um, that to me is, is important. The second thing I always try to understand is, do they have mentees? Like, are, are they actively mentoring people? Because to me, that shows that they're invested in coaching people and invested in giving back. It's the same thing. Like, I remember there was a, a time, like, I had to get smart, like, because I knew nothing about uh, recruiting. I knew innovation and design thinking and, and product strategy. Um, and I had to get smart. I'm like, okay, like, what, what are different schools of thought in, in terms of, of recruiting? And I, somewhere I read that uh, one of the things Google looked for is, volunteer experience um and another thing they look for particularly is have you like dedicated time to political campaigns because they want to see like are you willing to work towards a bigger vision uh, or are you willing to like give back um and how do you actually prioritize your time uh, and if you're volunteering places you're you're obviously able to structure your your time where you're still you know giving back for lack of better words i think those are really important little signals for the ability to move someone from IC or independent contributor to independent contributor to um, a manager role or a manager of manager role. I, mean, I jumped from 
I see to manager of managers. Um, and I think, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about this maybe some other time in another show, but I, I really, it took me, one of the biggest learnings I had working uh, abroad um, was, you know, there's just different types of leaders and different types of leadership styles. And I gave a talk at, at, uh, at Yale uh, one time and I talked about different types of leaders, but I always start with the same thing. Close your eyes and think of a leader. And then I ask people to share, what, who do they think of? So like, Jeff, if I ask you like, who's, what's a leader? Who's a leader that like, what comes top of mind? Who's the first person that comes top of mind when I say, who's a leader? I had like 15 of them that just like swirled in my head, but I'd say the, I think one of the first ones that came to my head was like probably Stacey Abrams. Okay. That's, that's awesome. So then I would say, like, if you have to think of archetypes, so I get a bunch of things for people. I say, okay, now if I think of archetypes, how would you categorize the leader you thought of? Um, so I'm like, right now I'm in like brand archetypes. I'm like, okay, there's 13 brand archetypes. So I'm like going through those or 12 brand. Archetypes. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess if I'm just like characterizing, I would say like selfless, self-sacrificing, courageous, um, honorable, just truthful, like, like, you know, yeah, yeah. all of those sorts of characteristics, I would say. Yeah. So what came to mind was, was, uh, was service, service oriented and selflessness. Like I may plop that up. So you just, you pop all these things up and it's just super interesting because what I have found in my, in my career, I had to make a decision. What kind of leader do I want to be? And this was very early on in my, my, my young twenties. And I learned from other people, there are different kinds. Sometimes there are leaders who are the ones who stand ahead of people and they pull someone forward. Maybe that's a Stacey Abrams, for instance, mm -hmm. they, 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 they march in front, they pull them with them. Martin Luther King, the big one. Other times there's people who, walk in the back and they're pushing the person in front of them. Hey, like we got really got to go. You know, maybe I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you move. Uh, and then the people who just walk side by side. And I call those like, those are the empathetic leaders. And what I've always desired to be is have situational awareness to know when do I need to be the person who's leading from the front, the person who's leading from behind, but ideally I'm the person who's shoulder to shoulder and we're walking together. Yeah. You're going to love my book. Um, I feel like you could have co-authored it because I mean, I'm, I'm so in the same camp with you on that. And um, you know, I, my first employee, when I had my agency, we've had this conversation like a hundred times. Uh, the conversation is called who got to you first. And I think so much of the way that we, um, we lead so much of the way that we maybe view our roles are products of the people that we, you know, studied under or that we saw and we think, oh, well, that's the way that a leader leads, right? So if you're under like a command and control style, you learn to be powerful, you learn to be direct, you learn to be aggressive and all these sorts of things. Or, you know, maybe you're under a different type of leader and then you learn to be empathetic and you learn to be uh, kind, you learn to be a coach and a mentor. Um, and part of the reason I wrote my book is I want to get to people first. And um, my book is called The Lovable Leader. So it's very much in the same vein. It's the idea of like, you want to be part of the team. You're not standing at the top cracking the whip. Sometimes you have to be in front leading the way. Sometimes you have to be behind people supporting them. But most of the time you want to be in the thick of it with them. You just have a different role. So I feel like you and I are very much on the same page with that. All right. So to wrap up, uh, I think you and I have a gajillion things we could talk about. So I'm going to have to invite you back for another episode. So I'm putting you on the hook right now. Will you come back and talk to me again for another I would, episode? I would love to come back and I'll make sure we're color code matching because now we, we, we have inverse right now. I've got the black shirt and the red, the red headphones. You have the red shirt with the black headphones. Yeah, that's right, man. We have great style. Um, cool. So where can people go to learn more about you, where they can go and connect with you, where they can go and um, you know, learn the stuff that you're working on, get involved, follow you. Now's your chance. Promote the hell out of yourself, whatever you feel yeah, yeah. about your show. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, uh, obviously LinkedIn's an easy spot. Uh, you know, you can go to liveperson.com. I'm actually, I would love for people to become my colleague. I mean, we have 200 plus roles open at Live Person and we're, we're really growing. And it's been really interesting the last six months as the telegraphical market is becoming even, even larger. People really see particularly, you know, we've got 20 years of conversational data. So a lot of data scientists are choosing to come work for us because they want access to that data to build models off of. It's, I'm, I'm really bullish and it's an exciting time in the company. So I would say reach out and uh, 
let's go be colleagues. From everything I've heard, I, I land my uh, explicit endorsement on if you're looking for work, I would tell you to go and apply and learn more about these positions. Uh, Marco, thank you so much for coming on the show. I am super excited that you have agreed publicly now to come back on my show because I feel like there's a gajillion things for us to talk about. Um, this episode was fantastic. I had a really good time. I really enjoyed what we talked about. So I guess people should tell other people about it, which would make this episode shareable. Wait, don't leave. If you've never listened to my fancy outro, do it just once for me, please. Okay, if you enjoy shareable and you find it valuable, there's a few ways that you can support the show. One, you can share it on social media, which I strongly encourage. I mean, it's literally the name of the show, Shareable. Two, you can review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're an Overcast user, as many of my listeners are, make sure to click that star button on the episodes that you like. The third way that you can support the show is by blogging about it or discussing it on your own podcast or even by making a YouTube video where you talk about one of the episodes. And then the final way that you can support the show is by supporting it directly on Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Now, before I let you go, I want to tell you about one other thing. You see, Shareable is just one of many projects that I'm working on at any given time. I've got another podcast called Rogue. I do a live streaming show every week called The Heroic Council. I've got a blog where I release a blog post twice a week. And if you're looking to keep up with all sorts of different content that can help you grow and become a superhero in life, I want you to check out jeffgibber.me. That's where I list all of my current projects and projects that are coming up in the future, including my forthcoming book, The Level of Leader. It would mean a lot to me if you could go and check out some of the other things I've worked on because I put just as much of my heart into those projects as I do into Shareable. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you for being a supporter. And I hope to see you here on the next episode of Shareable.